Uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for coming. We're going to be talking about an interesting asset class. It's an asset class that I, I love, I'm passionate about. Uh, it's, it's more of a hobby for me than, uh, than a job. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm just doing what I enjoy and what I love. So what we're going to cover today is uh, two uh, markets. We'll start off with uh, South Africa and then move on to global markets. So by global markets, we mean uh, developed uh, markets. So we'll start off with South Africa. But before we do that, I'd like just to give you a quick uh, introduction like who we are. We are the biggest listed property player in South Africa. We manage uh, close to 30 billion rand in, in assets, of which about 15% is from the group uh, Liberty and Standard Bank, and then 85% it's uh, third party money uh, from external clients. And we cover all property markets in the world, uh, from South Africa to emerging markets, to developed markets, to rest of Africa as well. And not only do we cover all these markets, we also have products across all those markets. If you need South African exposure, we can provide it. Rest of Africa property exposure, we can provide that as well. Emerging markets and uh, developed uh, markets. And ranked actually top quartile uh, across uh, most of uh, the um, rankings uh, locally and, uh, and globally as well. So our global fund has been ranked uh, second, third in some instances and mostly in the top quartile space. And our emerging markets fund is one of only a few in the world. There's about three emerging markets funds that we are aware of and it's still an early stage cycle in terms of emerging markets. And then we have an Africa listed property fund as well which invests in uh, West Africa from Nigeria to Kenya, Zimbabwe, Zambia as well. It's actually, it's the biggest Africa listed property fund in the world, but it's the biggest because it's the only one. There's no other Africa listed property fund. <laughs> and on the global fund, uh, our fund, as I mentioned earlier on, is done fairly uh, well locally as well with Morningstar Awards, uh, Raging Bull Awards as well. And then our local fund is, uh, is probably the most awarded fund with uh, 13 awards over the last uh, couple of, uh, of years. So that's uh, Stanley uh, listed property uh, in short. So what we want to focus on today is uh, this fund here, uh, the local property fund, that's the Stanley property income fund. And then later on, we move on to the global property fund. I love this quote by Mark Twain, uh, I've seen it a couple of times, they buy land, they're not making it anymore. It just shows actually how valuable property uh, is and you've got to have uh, listed property exposure, not only just residential exposure, but diversify and not only have equities, cash and bonds, there's always room for listed property in a balanced uh, portfolio. And just give you a perspective of uh, the numbers, how listed property has done over time. Since inception, our fund was launched in 2002. It's delivered a 25% annualized return over the last, uh, the last couple of years, and over 10 is over 21%. So this return is actually very amazing. And our aim is to outperform the benchmark by anywhere between 1% and, and 2%. Uh, percent. And we aim to do that consistently over time. And we're always fully uh, invested. So keep cash at only like 1% or 2% only for liquidity purposes. So our aim is to get a full property exposure. Year to date, the market has been pretty strong with 12.95% returns from our fund and from the benchmark 12.34. If we look at the asset class performance uh, year to date, property is by far the best performing asset class with uh, over 12% total returns compared to, let's say, equities at 2% uh, percent. and cash is second best performing. These numbers up to end of uh, August and bonds about 2.75. So yes, you can say that's short term. Even if you check uh, over the long term, 10 years, property as well has been the best performing asset class. Actually, if you look at over any period, be it year to date, uh, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, listed property just continues to uh, outperform. So the question is, can it continue actually delivering this kind of, uh, of, of returns? And what you like about property as well is that uh, it's less volatile. It's quite visible as well. Compare that to equities, the blue line and the red line. So the upward and down movement is actually less compared to equities. And always use bonds as a reference point. But bonds is more like a reference point just to price in listed property. But you can't compare actually the performance between bonds and property because bonds give you a flat coupon. That's why bonds over time 118%, whereas property 491%. The difference in that is actually mainly income. So we focus on rental income, income growth. That's what drives the property market. And most people don't seem to understand that. We believe that property is actually uh, simple. Property is all about this. It's actually how much income growth has been reported, what's the outlook, 
and look at the vacancies. Those are our key metrics that we look at at, uh, at Stanley. And if we look at the sector over time, over the last uh, say six months or 12 months, depending on the reporting period, most companies have done well, from resilient with 19% income growth, Fortress 20%. The only one that's probably not exciting, disappointing was Hospitality Property Fund. They invest uh, in hotels, and hotels are actually not in a good space at the moment. Uh, it was actually issues around Ebola, and then had uh, visas as well. You're seeing that um, the number of tourists are down like 20, 25% in terms of air ticket uh, purchases. So that's actually affecting hotels. And we are actually underweight hotels in our portfolio, and do prefer companies with higher income growth. So our model is simple. We focus on income growth. And the outlook is still uh, pretty actually good if we look at it. Mostly positive numbers, and our average income growth are looking about between 9 and 10% over the next uh, 12 months. Those are still good numbers. And what is helping to drive these numbers is actually uh, these companies, most of them have increased their offshore exposure. Offshore exposure makes up almost 30% of these numbers that we see here. So with the weaker end, with diversification across Australia, UK, Europe, uh, within Romania as well, that has helped to boost numbers. But our concern is probably more on the vacancy trend. We expect that to actually start picking up. Not out of control, but it will actually trend uh, upwards, mainly because of a weaker economy and we're seeing actually oversupply coming, coming through. So we may see most of those red colors uh, going uh, forward. So given that property continues to do well, we're seeing actually lots of appetite for listed property. And almost every company that comes to the market to raise uh, equity is actually oversubscribed. They get oversubscribed within a matter of hours. So there's two options for companies to actually uh, to fund acquisitions. So that through debt or equity, and this actually amount of equity that's been raised over time, 2011, 16 billion, 2014 was a record year of 40 billion rand. And year to date, actually the latest number is actually 19 billion, uh, given the last equity raise we've seen over the last uh, week or so. And then some of the companies raising equity, some of them are newly listed funds, like in the place, they are residential focused fund. So there's actually that strong appetite for listed property because of that income generating ability that we see. And some of the examples, companies actually uh, raising equity, they're funding acquisitions. We're seeing that interest in the offshore space. So newly listed fund that listed earlier in the year, new frontier properties, the buying shopping centers in the UK, mainly in the smaller uh, towns, not in London, where they can get actually higher yields because London just been very strong and just continues to be strong. So we're seeing that diversification into the rest of the world and mainly in the developed uh, markets. And there's potential new listings as well. Uh, this company, you may have seen some of these uh, storage signs as you drive past uh, Bitjobic or Pretoria or Cape Town. So they're looking actually to potentially list as well. So that's a completely new uh, sector, that's storage. It's quite big offshore. We don't have it uh, in, in our space. And talking about that, these are the sectors that we're exposed to. We're exposed mainly to the retail sector, followed by the office market and the industrial market. Residential is still quite tiny. It's probably closer to about 2% uh, now with the recent uh, transactions going on. And we expect that to almost double over the next year to two years with new listings, with more acquisitions in Jobek, uh, in Pretoria, mainly in the CBDs, high-rise apartments where vacancy is actually low. Looking at about 1% vacancy on average. Areas and bed debts, less than a percent. There's a waiting list for actual accommodation. And we like that sector, the residential sector. So let's look at uh, different sectors in more detail. So office market, I said, uh, it's probably our least favorite sector at this stage. We're seeing actually lots of supply coming through and rental growth is not actually exciting. So the bottom chart shows the rental growth, about 5% there, about slightly below inflation. And we expect that to probably continue at its low levels, not exciting levels, mainly because of vacancies. Vacancies about 11% there about. And we've got different sectors. We've got what we call the P grade space. Those are like new buildings, like your Alice Lane, your Alex Forbes buildings. Those have got low vacancies. People want to be in the modern buildings, more energy efficient, greener buildings. Whereas the C grade, those are older buildings. They tend to have higher vacancies because they're older. They've got less uh, parking ratio, like two bays per hundred or one bay per hundred, less appetite uh, for that. So the office market, pretty uh, not exciting actually at this uh, stage. And one of the things causing that is actually our supply coming through. Uh, if you drive around Santon, uh, they talked about that they have to close the roads next uh, month, but it's already a construction site. Wherever you go, you're just seeing lots of these big uh, buildings coming up. Just give you an example. This is the Sassel head office, over 60,000 square meters. 
So Sasol is looking to consolidate all, uh, all the operations into one big major building. And Discovery as well, that's a huge building, closer to 90,000 square meters. It's, it's a massive. And here that the basement is like eight levels actually going down. So imagine actually allocated minus eight uh, basement level, probably get to the office after 40 minutes or so, driving all the way down to the basement. And then this one as well, this one's not fully lit actually, that's owned by Redefine, they've got a big uh, to lit sign outside. So there's still actually some vacancies in some of those new buildings. So those are actually competing with all the buildings. And just to give you an example, it's a SAS will consolidate into the space. They're moving away from all the buildings, somebody has to take up that space. And so we've got so much supply actually coming uh, through. And looking at that in more detail, this shows actually the number of uh, developments compared to existing office stock. So it's current about 4% what we see now. And within actually developments coming up, the majority is actually in Santon. About 47% of the new developments find them in the Santon CBD. That's why you're seeing all that uh, construction site I mentioned. And vacancies, that's the vacancy trend. But you've seen actually the percentage of speculative stock. That means actually building without a tenant. It's actually coming down. It's close to about 30% uh, percent levels. So you still have those vacancies actually in those new buildings where they'll go to the market and look to let uh, that uh, space. So move on to the retail sector. The retail sector as well is seeing actually vacancies trending higher, but mainly in the smaller shopping centers. So we've got two categories here. We've got shopping centers less than 25,000 square meters and then above 25,000 square meters. So you've got to be bigger and dominant to actually have more demand for space, to have retailers willing to take up your space. But if you're smaller, you're less dominant, you find that actually vacancies tend to actually uh, trend higher. So now portfolios would prefer companies with bigger dominant shopping centers than the smaller shopping centers. And so that's to find the bigger shopping centers, they've got lower vacancies of about 3.2% there about, whereas the average vacancy level 5.4, and you expect that to continue to trend actually um, higher, mainly because of we've got supply coming through. And some shopping centers or asset managers are quite clever. They're looking to be more defensive, extend their shopping centers to be bigger and more relevant. It's just one of the examples. That's Wonder Park Shopping Center in Pretoria. That's Pretoria Northwest. They've extended by 30,000 square meters to be the dominant player in that, in that space. So retail is all about uh, dominance. And what you're seeing now as well is that uh, there's many more shopping centers coming up. This is just Joburg alone. We've got Mall of Africa. They've actually increased the size to 131,000 square meters. Mall of the South opening actually in the next couple of, uh, of, of months and next uh, September actually, and then Springs Mall, New Market Mall, all those new names coming up. So they're going to be competing with existing shopping centers. Retail sector is not as exciting. You're not seeing much after spend coming through, and that's the challenge with, uh, with uh, retail uh, space. And that's an example. The pictures we took about two, two months or so, three months ago, that's uh, Mall of the South, which is opening in, in September. All the big names. But Mall of the South not too far from Southgate Shopping Center from the Glen as well. So you may see actually uh, that cannibalization happening. Good example is actually in uh, the West Rand with Clearwater Shopping Center. You saw Cradleston open. It did take away some of the trading from Clearwater. So Clearwater's trading densities or their sales were flat uh, over the last 12 months because of that new shopping center coming up. So you're seeing that's the concern that we have. And Mall of Africa, that's opening early uh, next year in April, 131,000 square meters. So it's, it's a huge shopping center and with all the big names coming through. So it's, it will compete with Four Ways Mall, we'll compete with Santon City as well. So that's what we're going to watch out for actually going uh, forward. And look at the numbers as well. You've seen the pictures. In terms of numbers, why we're concerned about uh, so many shopping centers coming up is that the rate of growth in shopping centers far exceeds actually amount of retail spending. So forget about all the noise in this, uh, in this chart, we'll focus on, on this. That retail space growth on average from 2006 has been 7.5% per year. Whereas actually your retail spending, your retail sales only 3%. So our space growing at a double the rate of actually how much we spend. So it means somebody has to suffer. And unless this number actually picks up, this is likely to catch up with some of the shopping centers. So that's the retail market. And in addition, it's load shedding. Load shedding is actually a problem. And you're finding that somebody's got actually full um, uh, power generating capability. They'll advertise like this, that you've got absolutely no load shedding. So that you know when there's load shedding, you can go to a shopping center like uh, this one. But then the challenge as well is that uh, you have to invest in a generator. You have to keep it running and you spend money on diesel. Then you pass that cost to the tenant. But you can't pass all that cost to the tenant. So the landlord has to pick up some of the cost as well. And at the end, 
it's us actually investors actually picking up uh, that uh, cost. So load shading, we haven't had load shading long in a couple of days, but still actually a concern. We move on to the industrial sector. Industrial sector is actually a, a, a more preferred sector. We like it because the vacancies are fairly low, about 3.5%. Uh, Better rental growth of about 6.7%, so just above actually the inflation uh, rate. And when you invest in industrial, mostly in South Africa, it's mostly warehousing and distribution. We're moving away from manufacturing, and those are the sectors that we are actually more exposed to. The industrial warehousing market, where vacancies are low, rental growth is still fairly decent at about 5.5%. Uh, so we've talked about uh, the three uh, sectors. We like the industrial sector. We prefer bigger dominant retail, and we're cautious on the office uh, market in general. Then we move on to, to the valuations. How listed property behaves versus the bond market, as I mentioned earlier on. So what happens in general is that when bond yields go up, property prices actually go down. So same as, like, say, interest rates go up, property prices come down. And you can see that trend is quite visible here. So the red line, that's your property index. When bond yields go up, property goes down. When bond yields go down, you see property prices actually going up. But then there was actually an anomaly here in March, April, where so bond yields actually going up, property prices going up. So what drove that was that there was so much demand for listed property uh, from local players and also international players. We saw our property counters being included in a couple of uh, indices globally, MSCI, SMP, and all those actually big indices. And so there was so much demand from index trackers as well. We're just buying just to get that exposure. And when that probably stopped, you saw the market actually correct quite sharply by about 11% there about. But when you see these kind of corrections as well, they do create buying opportunities. Whereas you find that most investors, when market falls 11, 12%, they want to run away, they want to disinvest at that time. But actually that creates buying opportunities as long as you are getting income growth. And we're still fairly comfortable with income growth of about 9 to 10% over the next uh, year or so. And this was actually more like to do with Chinese uh, volatility, global market volatility. So in general, property has done uh, fairly well compared to other asset classes. And there's a strong correlation with the bond market, about 0.7 or so on average. With equities, most people say property is the same as equities. They're not actually the same asset class. Yes, over one year, probably slightly higher correlation. But over time, there's no correlation. There's no relationship between property and equities, even long term of 15 years. It's only a 0.21 correlation, just like a 21% relationship in simple terms. So which means that in a balanced portfolio, there is a space for an asset class that behaves differently from equities. So like a balanced portfolio is not balanced enough without a listed property. Which brings us to this as well. We talk about the bond market. What is the relationship with bond market if you look at it from a ratio basis? So what do we do here? We divide the property yield by the 10-year bond yield, just to get a pattern of that relationship over time. So the long-term average, you're looking at a ratio of about 0.88. So property, if it's up above that level, it's cheap. If it's below this level, it's actually expensive. And it's going to more like extremely expensive territory, which just keeps running uh, ahead of all the other markets. But then this chart can be actually misleading, because in 2005, there was no offshore exposure at all. Whereas now in the listed property sector, offshore exposure or offshore earnings make up almost 30%. So it means you've got to adjust for that. So when doing our outlook, uh, we adjust for uh, some of this. And also the fact that you've got two counters that don't pay out dividends that are included in the index here. There's Pivotal, then you've got Attack as well. So we'll make adjustments for that. And we'll have two scenarios. We've got what you call a normalized scenario and then the new normal. So in a normalized basis, from where we are, after making that adjustment, uh, we don't see much in terms of actually upside uh, in listed property because property just run. But we're comfortable with our income growth outlook of about 9%. This may actually surprise on the upside to about even 10, 10%. But from a total return basis, you're taking actually a knock twice. One, you're expecting bond deals to be higher at about 9%. So as bond deals move up, property prices actually suffer. And then we've got that correction as well where we take that ratio to about this level as well. So we've made two adjustments for that. And then we get to those uh, not so exciting total returns. And over four years, it's a more of a normalized number, but we exit at this level. We don't exit at 0.88, we exit about 0.83 there about after adjusting for the offshore exposure and some of the non-dividend paying stocks. Then we get to those levels with single digit returns, not as exciting. 
But what if we say there's actually uh, a new normal? The market has actually changed, it's adjusted, it's looked at it differently in terms of property. So instead of actually exiting at this level, we exit around about this standard deviation level and then at this level as well. And then from there, we get actually much better returns. But in simple terms, what you're saying is that uh, there's going to be limited capital growth uh, going forward. Four deals about 7%, and then you'll get about 1% to 2 or 3% from uh, capital appreciation, which is still actually decent numbers to get like 8 to 10% total returns from a sector that's delivered 20, 25% annualized returns for the last uh, 10 to 15 uh, years. And of course, it's a slowing economy as well. So getting that actually support mainly from the offshore markets and your annual escalations more than actually good uh, rental growth. Because what drives the property market is that the leases, they escalated 7 to 8% per year. And then the challenge is when those leases expire, they do not get much actually rental growth. So in simple terms, we're saying high single digit uh, total returns over the next couple of years from our listed property sector. But there's always a place for property in a balanced portfolio. So over time, because it's less volatile than equities, it's got a different actual earnings profile, uh, more predictable than equities. Whereas commodities change price on a daily basis, rents don't change. You sign a lease for three, four years, again, that rent for three to four years. That's what makes property defensive. There's room for property in a balanced portfolio. So it's an exercise that was done uh, with, with Cadiz, just look at how property behaves, adding property in a balanced portfolio. Just give you an example, let's say over 15 years, if, it, if we had zero property, you had 60% equities, 30% bonds, and 10% cash. But what if you add property, then you cut three asset classes on a pro rata basis, then the returns actually look much better. Over 15 years, 10 years, five years, three years, one year, and year to date. I didn't put a chart on volatility. Volatility is actually lower, which means you get better risk adjusted returns by adding property in your portfolio, mainly because of the income generating ability. I'll give you a simple example. So people can say, I can invest in ShopRite or pick and pay. I get a proxy for a shopping center. But if you invest in those companies, you see the sales come down. Six months later, your dividends actually, you feel it immediately when they pay out the dividend. But ShopRite and pick and pay, they've signed a 10-year lease. And that rent is escalating at 7 8% per year. So it's still paying rent. It's still going to pay your rent. So I'm getting actually more consistent earnings compared to, let's say, equities. That's where property actually scores compared to other asset classes. So to conclude on local market, we probably see more downside risk than, than upside risk. But on the upside, what we like is that if you're exposed to dominant shopping centers, you'll probably still do fairly well because there's still demand for space in the bigger shopping centers. You've got new names coming up in South Africa. H&M is coming to South Africa later this year. They're looking to open a couple of stores in the bigger shopping centers. Forever 21 is coming as well uh, later in the year. They've opened a canal, a canal work in Cape Town. They're looking to open across South Africa in the bigger shopping centers. So most bigger shopping centers, they don't have space for them. And you've got Cotton On, one of the best uh, trading retailers. I'm sure some of you could shop at Cotton On. It continues to do well. They're looking to open even more stores across South Africa. But they target the bigger dominant shopping centers. That's how we position our portfolios. And then increased offshore exposure. Uh, from Europe to Australia to the UK, we're seeing lots of transactions going on on a weekly basis. And then the third one is actually corporate action. Redefines just merge with Fountainhead. And they're going into, they've become big. They're going to the top 40 next, next week. So if they get bigger, you attract more investors, uh, more index trackers as well, that helps to push up prices. And I've got two counters on the reserve list for the top 40. Uh, that's Resilient and Nepi. And then potentially in the next quarter or second quarter, uh, two quarters to come, Fortress and Capital are working on their major. Once the major is finalized, they become the third biggest listed property company. So you may see up to five listed property counters in the top 40 over the next three to six months, other things being constant. So it means property is becoming actually even more actually uh, critical to look at. You can't actually ignore property. So property companies have done well, probably thanks to resource companies that keep falling, property just keeps actually uh, rising. So property has benefited from that. On the downside, rise in bond deals, we've talked about that, whether it's a downgrade or high interest rates in the US that could push up our bond deals. And the second one actually is just for illustration purposes that in case, because we've got so many counters going to these global indices, what if they actually fall out of those indices? We don't see that happening soon, but later, maybe some of the companies uh, do well, then that's probably a risk later on, not now. And then power outages, uh, that's a concern because that's increased operating costs for, for tenants. And not only that as well, 
rates and taxes, uh, they're growing at double digit levels, whereas rental growth is five, six percent, whereas rates and taxes anywhere between 10, 15 and 20 percent. So over time, that actually catches up with landlords. But landlords pass that over to the tenant. And you probably get to a point where the tenants are actually can't afford to actually pay actually more rent. Then that means your rental growth is actually uh, muted. So some of the concerns that we have in the local uh, market. So I'll move on to the offshore market, just probably give you a perspective, like what are we seeing in the offshore markets? There's so much growth in our local market, companies expanding into the offshore markets. Uh, that's a quote, that's from 1919, saying 90% of all millionaires become through, so through owning real estate. I guess probably now you can say 90% of all billionaires become so through owning real estate. So because so many people actually invest in listed property and or property in general, we've done uh, fairly well. So global property is actually a different topic. And then probably just want to get a sense of how are we positioning that space. We are actually one of uh, the players uh, in this market. And we work with so many uh, uh, listed um, property analysts across the world, from UBS to Macquarie. So all the big names that you find across uh, the world, they help us with the research. And also get independent research as well. And we've got our own systems in-house. Uh, Bloomberg will pay quite a lot as well. So whatever we do and access is the same as somebody sitting in New York, uh, in Tokyo, in, in London as well. So actually the same uh, position as them. And on a daily basis, this is what we do or ad hoc basis. And also do side visits, conferences, management meetings. And just give you an example, because property is physical. You have to travel. Like I've traveled across uh, the wall of uh, South Africa, every city, every major town. I've seen the properties, I understand them. And we apply the same mod model as well globally. So, so far this year, this is some of the countries we're going to, uh, we've been to China, Philippines, Indonesia. So we try to cover every continent uh, every year. So we've, uh, we've seen over 100 companies over the last couple of years and we've been to all the major nodes as well. We've actually run out of space here. We've been to other places like uh, Morocco as well. So that's our model to meet with the companies one-on-one, -on -one, <coughs> to do side visits and attend conferences. So last week I was actually in, uh, in East Africa. I've just come back from Namibia actually. Uh, this, I landed at 2.30 p.m. today. And the next week we've got a U.S. Uh, trip. That's a global real estate conference. So talking about that, um, that has actually worked well, actually our model of uh, traveling, meeting with companies, and our fund has actually performed very well. It's one of the best performing funds actually in the, in the world. And I performed the benchmark on average over the last year, about 7%. Uh, percent. So we've actually made great calls uh, by being, um, went under with the US and went over with the UK and Europe at the right, uh, right time. And we've picked the best stocks, the big dominant actually uh, shopping centers, offices as well, and being in the right sectors. So these are the returns actually in rand uh, terms. So on average, uh, properties delivered over 20, 25% annualized returns as well. And some of the best performing asset classes as well in the global uh, space. And the numbers actually show that over 15 years, property is actually in a league of its own. So property is this bar here. So these are over 15 years, almost double any other asset class. But that's a long-term investment. You don't invest in property for one year or three years or five years. We encourage investors to take a five to 10 year view when investing in these markets. So that's USD exposure. So the difference is that you're probably getting some about 375 on base to 100. But if you look at it in rand terms, about 700. So it means we've made actually double the return just from currency uh, depreciation. So in the offshore space, you've got to factor in actually that currency can work for you. It can actually work against you as well. And year to date, not as exciting returns in the offshore space. We've seen actually these companies actually um, deliver negative returns. So the returns have been actually negative 7% uh, year to date in US dollars, but they're up 10% in rent terms. That means you've probably made uh, most of your return just from, okay, all your return basically from currency uh, depreciation. So what the markets are in the offshore space, they're actually pricing in uh, potential interest rate hikes in the US. And we believe that's been priced in over this period. And this period here has been because of the global market's volatility and actually uh, mainly China just driven the markets down. And that creates actually buying opportunities because on the ground, things are actually uh, solid. I'll just touch on that now. And what's the relationship with the US 10-year bond yield? That's the reference point actually globally. So when the US 10-year bond yield goes uh, down, property prices go up. When the bond yield goes up, property prices go down. But over this period, US 10-year went down, but property prices went down as well. But so you do find those kind of anomalies as well, where the market actually ignores what's happening in the bond market because of global uh, market's volatility. And offshore property, local property is trading at all-time highs, just continues to trade at all-time highs, mostly. 
whereas offshore property is 29% below the peaks of 2007. So still got a long way to go actually get back to where it was. And what are we exposed to when we invest in our offshore markets? So it's actually the global property space, uh, US about 55%, uh, uh, followed uh, by the UK at about 9%, and then Australia 8%. So US quite actually dominant in the space because that's the rich market, the global rich market. And in terms of sectors, there's much more sectors. In South Africa, we said we've got retail, office, and industrial. Whereas in the global space, uh, we've got so many sectors. Uh, we've got healthcare as a sector. We've got residential, 12.5% residential. Whereas it's still about 2% here. Residential is big, mainly in the US and in Germany. And we've seen some local counters actually investing in German uh, residential and also in the UK residential uh, market. And then there's other sectors as well, under specialized. We've got like data centers. So like all these cell phones that you're using, the pictures you're taking, that data stored somewhere in the data centers and we invested in those and uh, there's actually good demand for those. And then we've got um, what you call um, communication, like tower reads as well for your cell phones and signals, you can invest in that. And you also can invest in, in prisons. And so like prisons, cause prisons, you actually lock in your tenants uh, for some time and then go anywhere anytime soon. So that's kind of a diversification that you get in these, in these uh, markets. So that's why this market tends to behave differently compared to the local market, because it's so diversified. We've got hotels as a big sector in that space. And move on to the different sectors uh, across uh, the world. Office market, we don't like it actually locally, but in the offshore space, we love it. We love actually UK offices, because there's limited supply. There hasn't been any construction going on. In the, U in, the, in, the, in the US as well, New York, Manhattan as well, fairly actually limited supply, because banks actually stopped funding most of the new developments. It's difficult as a private developer to get actually funding compared to long back. So the office market in general, actually very actually strong in most markets. London, Tokyo, New York as well, we've got big exposure in that space. So you're finding even local companies, South African companies, investing in some of those uh, nodes. Moscow, you can see actually uh, we don't have exposure in that space. Singapore is slowing down and uh, you're finding actually Hong Kong as well, will probably slow down soon, mainly because of China. And then in the retail space, Retail very actually strong across uh, the world in general. And we love the retail market, mainly dominant uh, shopping centers. And people always ask about online shopping. Online shopping, yes, is going to be a risk uh, for shopping centers, but for smaller shopping centers. Whereas for the bigger shopping centers and the more creative landlords, you're finding that they actually change the concept of actually uh, uh, shopping. So I'm saying they're creating internet resilient uh, shopping centers. So what they're doing now, I find that shopping centers are providing like maybe free parking. You can come and do a click and collect through a shopping center, so it's easy. So like Amazon's coming in and bringing their post boxes and everything inside the shopping center. So yes, you're going to collect your stuff from Amazon, but you're going to buy a coffee, you're going to buy the chocolate as well. You find something, that nice shoe as well, end up buying it, that you intend to buy it. And uh, you're finding that as well with uh, online shopping, uh, click and collect is quite popular. But what lenders are doing now, they're creating like nice apps as well. That uh, you log into your app, then you get uh, like a free voucher as well. And those apps actually make it easy for your shopping. Uh, for your car as well, easy to find actually your, your car. Just go through that app, just shows you where you park your car. Because most people get lost in the shopping center, can't find your car. So it's made that easy. And some of the stores as well, like, uh, like products. If you're looking for a black jacket, it's size 45 or 46. You just tap on that app that I'm looking for a black jacket, size 46. And just tells you the number of stores with those black jackets and gives you directions as well to that, uh, to that store as well. So it makes shopping more pleasant and you're willing to go to a shopping center. And some of them have changed the concept that uh, food, entertainment, beverage, about 25% of the shopping center. Whereas before you used to have like your food courts, which is probably 35% uh, of the shopping center. Whereas actually it's a nice environment just makes you, uh, you can stay longer, you can enjoy a coffee, you can enjoy a nice meal, restaurant type of actually uh, feel. And one of the companies that's been doing that is Unibuy Redemco which is uh, one of our biggest uh, investments uh, in, uh, in Europe. They're the biggest pan-European uh, shopping center landlord. So they spent lots of money making their shopping centers look nice, very nice flowers, lovely features as well. People can take selfies, they can actually enjoy themselves and nice and colorful. So they spent a lot of money actually developing apps and uh, making that nice and, and pleasant. And the other sector that we like as well within the shopping center space, you find the outlet centers. So outlet centers, you can get discounts of up to 80%. And these centers are doing up to 10, 15% rental uh, growth. And it depends how fashion conscious you are. So outlet centers, say, uh, they sell stuff that's actually uh, a season behind. 
But for me, I can't tell whether I'm buying some stuff from last year's season. I'd rather just buy it at 80% uh, off than buy it at a full uh, price. And we've got lots of tourists going to those kind of centers, and that sector actually continues to do well. It's actually the best performing retail actually sector. So that's the retail sector. We'll move on to the industrial sector. The industrial sector is very, very actually strong. Actually, there's no way you can find rental values falling across industrial nodes in general. And what's driving the industrial sector is mainly warehousing, e-commerce distribution as well. Yes, there's a bit of manufacturing here and there, but the industrial sector is actually pretty strong. And that's the result of that. It's because of e-commerce, huge growth in e-commerce over time, from, let's see, 150 billion all the way to over like a trillion um, dollars. And percentage of e-commerce, 2%, now it's like 6 7% there about. That's globally. Whereas in markets like UK, you're looking at about uh, 15 to 20% of your sales actually done online. And in the UK, we invest a lot actually in uh, warehousing and distribution, logistics centers. And UK has actually been amazing. They're actually way ahead of everybody else. They're doing same day deliveries now. And in some instances, actually, they can deliver within an hour. So you go for lunch, you make, place the order, you come back for lunch, then your stuff is delivered at your office. So that's how advanced actually some of these markets are. And then you can't actually ignore technology. You just got to move along with the technology. That's what we like, like data centers, we like industrial sector and warehousing. The other sector that I touched on briefly is uh, self-storage, which is a new sector that's coming to South Africa. And we've got two players, but only one's actually looking to list at this stage. Vacancy coming down sharply. As people actually get jobs, they move uh, cities, they move uh, around, they, like, they want self-storage space. And rentals in the U.S. growing quite fast. One of the big sectors in the U.S., and so it's a sector that to watch out for going forward. Because in terms of you want to downscale, you've got that price position that you can't give away. And maybe it's winter, you've got that price and that's taking so much space in your balcony, you can put it in the self-storage facility and go and take it back in summer. But then this market is, you can't build a self-storage too far away from the city. It has to be close to where actually people live. So there's actually supply constraints. You can't actually just build anywhere. So it's a very strong sector, pretty strong sector, because it's location specific. So we've talked about fundamentals, about different sectors, self-storage, retail, industrial. Let's move on to valuations. So why is actually offshore property uh, attractive to the local South African companies, uh, to us as well for our investors and our products? It's because it's looking fairly cheap. There's a global bond yield and property yields. So there's a huge gap between property yields and bond yields. And property doesn't chase bond yields all the way down. So you're actually able to buy actually uh, nice properties. Year one, you're actually in the money. Year two, you're making money as well. So I find all the companies actually can make actually lots of money by buying offshore properties. And remember, I said the price is still 29% below the peaks of 2007, where South Africa is trading more at all-time highs. And on a yield basis, South Africa is completely the opposite. Property is actually below bond yields. Forward yield is about 6.8, 6.9 from our local property, whereas bond yields 8.4, 8.5, with fairly similar earnings growth. They're looking at about 8% earnings growth in the offshore space. So look from that, you look at from uh, this basis as well, offshore property is actually cheap. That's the long-term average, gap current 217 uh, basis points. From a ratio basis, we did South Africa on a ratio basis, South Africa is completely the opposite, so somewhere here. Offshore pro property is going the opposite direction, which actually creates actually nice opportunities from it, that yield gap, yield ratio basis. From an NAV basis, it's cheap as well. They're getting these assets at 5% uh, discount to NAV. Where South Africa is trading at 30%, they have a 30% premium to NAV. So basically, you're paying 30% above what the physical asset is worth. Whereas in the offshore space, you're getting a discount of 5%. It's like a sell, you're getting 5% discount to get some of these nice assets. Correlations we said South Africa, bond yields, and property, they're sitting somewhere here, 0 0.7, they're about that strong correlation. Whereas offshore space, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, just all over the place as well. Because we've got so many sectors. We've got more than 10 different sectors in this market. With equities, that's coming down. So which means they get an asset class as well that behaves fairly differently from the key other asset classes, equities and uh, bonds. And if we look at the correlation pattern, it's just all over the place. Times up, times down, that's the brown line. That's property versus bonds. Because we've got different sectors, different periods as well, which actually creates Fairly nice diversification because it doesn't go in one uh, direction. And then we'll move on to interest rates because uh, people say interest rates are going to go up. What's going to happen to property? Yes, property is actually sensitive to interest rates. It will react when actually there's massive changes. As you saw with the taper tantrum uh, in uh, 2013, property fell 17%. 
and those who were scared because they just uh, ran away with the noise, ran away with everybody, um, they missed out on that opportunity. When the market falls like this, you're still getting earnings growth. Um, there's limited vacancies, limited supply. That creates buying opportunities. And we've seen the market correct as well, about 10, up to 15% now, with uh, higher bond yields and uh, Chinese market volatility. That also creates actually uh, opportunities. Because on the ground, we mentioned that vacancies are low and there's limited supply. There's limited funding from the banks as well, and that creates lovely opportunities. So what happens if there's actually a rate hike? We've got two uh, previous cycles here, the 98, 99. So it massive rate hikes here. Property was pretty uh, flat, just quite a volatile period at that time. And then we had like 2004, 2006 uh, rate hiking cycle. So property did almost 100% returns when rates are going up. So how do you explain that? It's that rates go up because the economy is doing well. So it's different when rates raised to project a currency. So US was raising, uh, uh, raised to actually cool down the economy. So rates are going up, the economy is doing well, employment is going up, rents are going up, vacancies are going down. That's why property actually can actually deliver returns. So you don't, you can't, don't be too scared of actually rate hikes. And when rate hikes happen, actually the market is actually priced that in. Let's look at that on a closer basis. So before the rate hike, Fed rate hikes, property fell 15%. And then once it started hiking rates from the first rate hike there, almost 100% returns, total returns. So we believe that the US is actually a pretty strong market. GDP has been revised upwards, and you may see actually that growth continue actually in the US. So that could be a similar picture to this. We believe some of that is priced in. Yes, we may get a rate hike bit next week on the 17th or maybe in the next meeting. But after that, that's kind of priced in the market. Because um, earnings property space, they track GDP growth. So as GDP growth improves, you see that as well. So the blue line, that's your GDP growth. The brown line, so the, so the brown line is GDP growth. The blue line, that's the earnings from property companies. So very strong correlation. So if you believe in GDP growth, uh, be it in the Eurozone, be it in the US as well, that creates a compelling case to have actually listed property as well in the global space. So with all that, we've done all the numbers. There's so many things, scenarios as well to come up with uh, our total return outlook. So in terms of earnings growth, we're looking on average globally about 8% in dollars uh, earnings growth, which is fairly good actually, compared to South Africa at 9% to 10% in rand terms, so 8% there. And then our bull bearing case over one year, that's in dollars, about 8%. On the bearish case, assuming 10 bond yields go to 3% from the current levels of 2.1, 2.2. That's a massive move from 2.2 to 3%. And then probably still gives you positive returns. And if things probably stay where they are, then probably could deliver double digit returns. Our four year case is actually a more normalized case, but there may be a new normal. I didn't give that scenario here. The 10 year bond yield goes from 2.1 to 4.25, so almost doubled but then saying about 6% to 7% annualized total returns in dollars. So that's in dollars. So assuming that you've got that massive increase, actually interest rates in the US, that means the rand could weaken and weakness in rand, you probably add it to those numbers. If you believe the rand will strengthen because we can a lot, then you subtract that from those total returns. But for us, we don't make currency calls. Currency is difficult to predict and we don't hedge any currency. We'll just buy what we actually like and we'll find uh, opportunities. So those are the different scenarios. And how does global property do in a balanced portfolio? It's the same story as well. The higher the property exposure, uh, the higher the returns in a balanced portfolio with equities, uh, cash, and uh, bonds. But the key thing for us is income. When investing in these companies, we want defensive income, dominant properties that can sustain this red buzz. Even in tough times of 2007, 2008, when the markets fell 50%, the big dominant companies, they still paid you out distributions. You still got something. But if you invested in equities, equities actually didn't pay out anything there. There was no, there was no dividend. They just cut on the dividends completely. Whereas property companies, those equity companies, they're still tenants. They're still paying rent. They may, may be making profits, but they have to pay rent because they can't vacate that space. That's why property is most defensive, actually, asset class compared to equities and, uh, and, and, and bonds, actually, over time. So the red bus sort of focused on capital, can be volatile up and down. If markets fall down like this, that's a massive buying actually opportunity if things on the ground are actually solid. So our conclusion, we see more upside than downside in the offshore space, better than expected growth, mainly in the US. So the Eurozone, yes, they still continue their QE. Over time, that will bring in benefits, but you're going to get lower for longer interest rates, which means funding is cheaper, which means it's easier to gear and make much more profits from that yield gap 
the yield you're buying it and how much you're finding it. So there's a big gap, as I mentioned, and they're seeing big allocation by sovereign funds from Hong Kong to Japan. They're all looking for prime properties. They're buying actually in, in, the, in New York, uh, in, the U, uh, in the US, uh, London as well. They're buying all the prime properties. There's so much competition for prime properties because they're taking a long-term uh, view. And you're seeing actually limited supply of properties, not much construction going on. For example, if you've been to London lately, most of the construction is actually residential property, like uh, to, to sell for development. Whereas uh, most office blocks, the big ones coming like in two years time. So there's limited supply in terms of the office uh, market. And the retail sector, you may not see actually big shopping centers coming through. Actually, the UK takes you more than 10 years to rezone land. So you have to wait for at least 10 years to actually move it around. Where South Africa is easy. There's a vacant land, then you can actually get and build a shopping center. UK, you cannot actually do that. And then the market is still actually equity driven. So most of those purchases we're seeing now, it's actually equity. It's not debt uh, driven. So which means if there's another cycle to come through, it won't be as severe as the previous cycle, which is debt driven. This is cash buying these assets. On the downside, that's the usual one. High bond yields, higher than expected bond yields, higher than expected interest uh, rates, and they may be lower than expected e uh, economic growth. So that's the story. Robert Kiyosaki says um, real estate investing, even on a small scale, remains a tried and true means of building an individual's cash flow which is the yield that we're talking about, and wealth, that's your capital appreciation uh, over time. So there's room for property, be it local property or Africa or emerging or developed markets uh, uh, property. So you just got to time it well and actually take a long-term view, say five to 10 years. Don't uh, try to trade portfolios uh, in and out over three to six months because our main aim is to invest in income and then capital growth over time. Thank you. That's my property story. Ladies and gents, we do have some minutes left. If you have some questions, we're going to try and mark you so we can pick them up on the uh, webcast down one in the front. And then, as I said, I'll finish sharply on time, uh, and then we can pick up maybe a few afterwards. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, you mentioned healthcare. Yes. Uh, what about, I assume you're talking about hospitals? That's right, yes. What about net care and... Um, and MediClinic yes. is really the property place. That's right. Sense. Yeah. I want to like your views on that. And also maybe Steinhof that has a 44 billion rand uh, in a property portfolio. Sure. Investing in those kind of shares. Thank That's you. That's right, yeah. So actually we've been, uh, there's been opportunities for the healthcare funds to come through in South Africa. It's quite big overseas. But I see the problem with some of the big corporates actually, they don't need actually cash at the moment. So they are probably cash flush, and if they sell those assets, they're saying, what do we do with the cash? So we've been uh, trying to find ways we can have uh, hospitals listed, because hospitals are lovely assets as well, because people fall ill in good times, in bad times, and there's always nice cash for long leases, but it's just a challenge that they're not desperate uh, sellers. And again, as well, there's been talks with Stan of a couple of listed companies as well. We haven't seen anything come out of that. But that creates opportunities over time, that there are still some assets that are still sitting outside the listed space that could come through. And talking about that as well, the REIT legislation has enabled to, uh, most developers to come into the listed space because you can bring in your assets and then you defer your capital gains uh, tax. As I say, most of the private players from Upland to Atterbury, they are listed all their portfolios. So over time, that's not actually impossible because there's lovely tax benefits or you can defer your tax. So we'd love to see more sectors like that in our space. Uh, Keelan, sure. excellent presentation. You Thank can you. see your passion coming through for property there. Um, two questions. Sure. Um, when you showed us the the relationship between bond yields and property yields, and you can see that for some time uh, the property has has been in line with the bond yields or even exceeded it, mm. do you also think uh, to some relation the money printing going on all over the world has had an effect? And then secondly, which one of your ETF shares should we buy for our tax-free accounts? Mm, sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, actually, talk about uh, the money printing. We saw that quite a lot um, in Europe. Probably US played itself out over the last uh, couple of years. As I mentioned earlier on that, uh, we, were, we had gone over with the US until a point whereby the valuations looked uh, extreme because of uh, the cheap money coming through. And in Europe, it's actually happening this year. It's actually a very, very hot market that everybody's outbidding each other because there's so much cash uh, available. 
So, so you've got to be selective when investing in some of those assets because people tend to overpay for assets if they can't get the prime assets. So rather stick to prime assets because over time they'll actually remain dominant and you can get the capital appreciation. So there's actually cash in that space. And then in terms of uh, ETFs, uh, we do have a Stanley uh, ETF property fund, Tracker fund, and also have uh, like the property income fund, and we do have uh, tax-free uh, savings uh, solutions. So all our property funds, be it a Tracker, property income fund, you can get access to that. Just a quick point on the ETF. So there are two, uh, one issued by somebody else, mm. one issued by Stanlib, both tracking the SAPI, South African Property Index, and Stanlib one is cheaper. Ladies and gents, I'm going to leave it there. Kieran, really appreciate your time this evening. Uh, definitely an important asset class, a whole bunch wiser from it. I know certainly I am. Um, I need to go look at my portfolio because that sure. house that Standard Bank owns doesn't qualify. <laughs> um, so really appreciate the time. Thank the you. video will be online over the weekend. We are back uh, October 15 with Petri Radenhuis talking about trading. Uh, thank you all very much for your time. All the best, everyone. Cheers. Thanks.